writers such as Hawthorne, Emerson, and Thoreau actually used to visit the Shakers. Uh, why do you think they did that? Were they just tourists? Well, no. Um, uh, the, these writers, um, some of whom were transcendentalists and some of them weren't, Hawthorne certainly wasn't. He was much too skeptical. But nevertheless, they were. There was there was a very there was a burgeoning time of people dreaming of utopian communities, of 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 worlds that would be fairer and more humane and just than 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 human society was at the time or is today, and so they were tremendously curious about this communistic society where people shared everything where people cooperated to an extraordinary extent and um, and and also the, 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 the Shaker communities were, were very uh, widespread. Uh, there were about 20 of them in, in the Shaker heyday, which is what we're writing about. Uh, so uh, people like Hawthorne and Emerson and Thoreau were very interested in this experiment, partly because they had seen a number of similar experiments fail very, very bitterly. Um, uh, George Ripley uh, started a, a community of Brook Farm in Massachusetts, and this was largely a transcendentalist-inspired uh, uh, community, uh, and it failed very, very badly. Emerson just had no use for it all. Uh, Hawthorne joined it because he thought it would give him more freedom to write, but then he found out he was going to have to dig ditches, and he didn't like that very much. And, uh, and it didn't last very long. And there was also a Robert Owen's uh, New Harm Harmony uh, community in Indiana, and that didn't work very well either. So there were, com there were utopian communities dropping like flies left and right, but these very eccentric, very bizarre this very bizarre community with strange beliefs, with uh, who who believed in complete separation of the sexes, but also complete equality of the sexes, uh, and who had very very rigid rules, very elaborate rituals, uh, seemed to be doing something that nobody else could do. Now the transcendentalists weren't entirely enthusiastic about the Shakers. Uh, Emerson thought that celibacy was a, a ridiculous idea. He thought that the uh, the uh, ceremonies and the uh, the dances and songs of the Shakers were laughable, but he couldn't quite get past the fact that these people were doing something that nobody else could do. That that, that they 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 shared and, and they were a truly communistic society and they somehow or other managed to function in the midst of a world that didn't operate the same way so they were quite interested quite quite interested in it um, I would say that uh, Henry David Thoreau uh, comes across as more or less the the conscience of our book he becomes one of Anna's best friends and I remember when we were working on the book. I, I expected uh, Thoreau to be uh, quite a different kind of figure. I expected him to be more of a, a devil's advocate uh, against the Shakers, because as we all know, you know, Thoreau liked to live in the woods by himself, and his own ideas about civil disobedience were, were, were based on uh, what an individual should do. He didn't consider himself a reformer, he didn't like reformers, but he really didn't believe that a person of con conscience had to participate in things that he didn't believe in. Why would he be attracted to the Shakers? Well, we find him more and more Anna's conscience telling her again and again, you really, really are a Shaker. Everybody has to follow their own path, and I think that's the, the central message of Thoreau. Other uh, other really extraordinary people uh, got interested in the Shakers um, during the course of their history, and one of the figures that most fascinated me was fairly late in the 19th century when the Shakers were supposedly beginning to decline. Uh, Leo Tolstoy began to carry on a correspondence with uh, Frederick Evans, brother Frederick Evans, who was really the uh, most brilliant 
intellectual theologian of the Shakers, and they carried on a correspondence about about Shaker values and so forth. And Tolstoy just thought the Shakers were fantastic. Uh, and I'm sure that if, if Tolstoy had lived in the United States, he would have joined the society. One thing that attracted more ordinary people to the Shakers was they were warm in the winter, they, had, they grew their own food, they were well fed, and uh, at that time they provided the best schooling that was available. Oh yeah, that's very important. So people joined the Shakers for those reasons, yeah. and there were also uh, groups called Winter Shakers who used to arrive when the weather started getting cold and proclaim their uh, desire to be a Shaker and then wander off again in the spring when it was warm. And the Shakers put up with that very, yeah. very gracefully. We have our character Thoreau say, the Shakers are the only people I know who do their best all the time. And I think that's what we can relate to, uh, whether you agree with the Shakers or not. I certainly think they made mistakes. I can't imagine living under all those rules. And of course, their rules changed over a period of time during Anna's life, lifetime in the story. One of the things that I admire about them is that the leaders made the same demands of themselves that they made of everyone else. Uh, they didn't have more stuff. They didn't have more freedom. They, uh, there were a few people who were uh, merchants uh, who sold Shaker goods who got to go out into the world. But most of them were, uh, were just like the rest of the community. And this is one of the, this is one of the things that uh, becomes an argument whenever you talk about socialism or communism, uh, is that it destroys incentive. The Shakers were incredibly industrious and inventive people. They invented the steam turbine. They invented the uh, circular saw. They invented the clothespin. Uh, and of course, they created uh, beautiful furniture. Uh, and they weren't motivated by profits, although they did sell their goods to the world, it would certainly help their, 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 uh, their society survive. But, but work for the Shakers was an act of worship. And, and so, so it's, it's hard for uh, most of us to enter into that frame of mind of, of understanding that you know, when, you, when, you, when you, you work at something, it, it, it's actually sacred. And their interest in simplicity, their belief in simplicity, created uh, excellent designs in furniture and, and usable items, uh, an idea that was not picked up by the outside world for until uh, modernity swept in. Yeah. Well, that's a bit of a paradox there, because they considered themselves anti-beauty. Yeah. They, 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 they weren't trying to make beautiful things, but in making things so simple and so elegant, we still you know, we fall in love with those yeah. with there those they forms. Are beautiful. Yeah. I remember uh, getting onto a conversation on Facebook with somebody who, uh, who uh, was uh, arguing with me about social politics, and I mentioned the Shakers in passing, and she said, well, the Shakers are extinct, so a lot of good their communism did them. Well, the Shakers started in 1793. As of today, there are three surviving Shakers. I think we have to give them some credit. They were there for they, a long they, time. They're, they're, they're not only were they there for a long time, they're still there. There are only yeah. three of them left, but they're still recruiting, yeah. and there are going to be more. So this experiment is not over yet.